And further on, we'll leave this uh, subject apart and we'll come back to our Pope, which is pretty controversial in his own uh, church. And there's quite a number of books that are indicating that uh, Pope Francis is working against the church's tradition and teachings in favor of the, as it says here, the liberal left and the general WEF agenda and United Nations agenda towards a world order, a world religion. In matters of the world religion, there have been great steps taken by Pope Francis. We know that he has signed uh, an historic covenant with Islam. That's in 2019. In 2020, he has uh, used this Islam prayer, calling people for all faiths and of no faith to unite in prayer, fasting, and works of charity for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. Apparently, it seems to be a very good purpose just that this is taking away the reproach of the Lord towards the pagan religion, because you truly cannot have gods that are contradictory to each other. So, as the Lord says very clearly in the scriptures, you cannot serve two masters, because uh, you have to work for one and betray the other, if they are working for different purposes. So, Pope Francis also calls for global governance and universal vaccines. I wonder what Pope knows about uh, universal vaccines, especially about the mRNA vaccines, which are a very peculiar piece of new technology. So, it seems, so it appears. So, Pope says, referencing to the COVID-19 pandemic, that the world had been forced to confront a series of grave and interrelated socioeconomic ecological and political crisis. So he places this interconnected crisis before him, not before God, of course, but before the World Bank and the IMF, which are evidently controlled by the wealthiest elites of the world, by the uh, families of uh, bankers, who, by the way, are not Christians, as many of us may know today. They are Luciferian in tradition and in action. Right? He says that I believe that the financial industry, which is distinguished by its great creativity, will prove capable of developing agile mechanisms for calculating this ecological debt, and so on. So the solution is with them. And for sure is not with the Lord God and with his teaching. That if it would be applied, of course, there would be no problems in the world, all you need is brotherly love and compassion and forgiveness and the proper education in the Holy Spirit. Now we see that the Pope is very much into uh, vaccination, really, that's on the Expos and News, which is a very interesting and uncensored uh, website that I would highly recommend. And uh, yeah, you won't find it uh, referenced too much on YouTube, surely. And it says here in 2021, July, uh, it was about uh, the people allowed to attend the upcoming mass. Yeah, they have to be fully vaccinated already. I think it meant two vaccines for that time, right? I think he's got also a point with the vaccine that he has uh, emitted, you know, to celebrate the high technological solution, the final one to the pandemic. And here we have Pope Francis calling for a new world order. It seems exactly with these words after the pandemic, this is from March 2021, so the pandemic wasn't over, and in fact it is not over, only that the causes may be a bit different than what is meant to be by using a failed PCR test. So the Pope says that we can heal injustice by building a new world order based on solidarity, studying innovative methods to eradicate bullying, poverty, and corruption. Yet all working together, each for their own part, without delegating and passing the buck. It sounds very communitarian, if not communist in uh, nature, because, yeah, 
uh, willing or not, everybody needs to do their job. This new world order will be based on eradicating inequalities and attending to the environment. Yeah, communists surely promise that they will eradicate the inequalities between people. The environment issue is added here, and as we very well know, when they speak about the environment, they speak about uh, C and O and 2 and generally pollution. They don't speak about other technological means through which weather can be directly and uh, militarily influenced and determined by human beings with big money. No, they're not speaking about this at all. They're not speaking about methane issue very much either. But uh, there's a lot about this suggested in the new revelation, which I'm going to speak again about. So anyway, there's a latest book of uh, this book. It's a book-length uh, interview, in fact, with an Italian journalist called God and the World to Come, in which he again calls for a new world order where humanity salvation, salvation, doesn't depend on God, is achieved by the creation of a new model of development, which unquestionably focuses on coexistence among peoples in harmony with creation. Uh, not with God's will and order, but uh, with creation. And for sure, when he speaks about salvation, he speaks about the physical salvation and not the spiritual one. Uh, yeah, again, he speaks about fraternity, calling for an end to manufacturing and trafficking arms. So guess who's got the money for this? The same people who own the World Bank and the IMF. But it doesn't matter. He still expects the solution from them. So, yeah, we have this um, Roman-based biblical scholar, who I think is not a name, who says... Francis is ushering a novel soteriology and so and so. Why else take another term pivotal to the gospel's salvation and to Jesus preaching the kingdom of God and replace it with the impoverished vocabulary of a new world order? A term that not only stinks of the messianic megalomania of politicians like George Bush and Tony Blair, by the way, were criminals, both of them, but also has the fingerprints of Freemasonry all over it. And why? Yeah, of course, there is an answer to this. So nothing is happening by chance. So, yeah, another interview with the Eco Magazine Inhabited describes Pope Francis as an ecologist in preaching and in practice, holds to an integral ecology. So, yeah, I think it's very good to be kind with God's creation. It is said, preach the gospel to all creation. We are stewards of the earth because the earth is the creation of god but yeah we have to see what are the real problems and who and how is meant to solve them so you don't go to the ones who are now ruling the world and we know how they're doing it unless unless unfortunately you are working for them but that's another question. So Pope Francis, uh, that's again from 2019 that I, I have quoted before. This is the Declaration of Human Fraternity for World Peace Covenant with Muslim Imam, creating the one world religion of Islam. You may believe this or not. I don't think it is called Islam, but uh, it is suggesting that it's a, it's a unity between these two religions because, of course, the one great danger at the moment, says the Pope, is destruction, war, hatred between us. If we believers are not able to shake hands, embrace one another, kiss one another, and even pray, our faith will be defeated. But there is no our faith. There's two different faiths. And if at a, a human individual level, love is meant to exist between people, Love is meant to exist even for the enemy, if you're a true Christian, as the Lord has taught us. In matters of faith, the truth of the doctrine, you know, and the basic tenets of Christianity, you must admit that the Lord has given us the sword, you know, the word, the spiritual tool. So there must be a debate. There must be a spiritual fight between the various religions. It doesn't involve in any way, shape, or form, people to physically harm or kill each other. Because, especially for us Christians, the truth must be spoken in love. Love 
must conquer paganism. And it will, it will. This is very clearly predicted in the gifts of heaven in the new revelation. It is the, the love of the Lord that will conquer the world. The, the world is hungry for this wonderful, merciful, unconditional love of the Lord. And this is the word, you know, in word, in doctrines. You cannot make abstraction of this because you give up on the tool of uh, salvation, surely. You cannot praise God if you don't know who God is. And for some of us, and especially for me as a disciple of the Bible and the New Revelation, God is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. It's not the same for my friends that uh, dear to Islam. That's the situation. It's very understandable. They have been taught this since they were children. They have been converted. They, they believe in this. That's their faith. And no worries about this. An awakening can, can happen in this life or in the next one. Although many Christians do not believe this, there are examples given in the New Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ is visiting sooner or later all people, even the ones in hell. Just a glimpse of goodwill is needed for having his visitation and his support. But the Pope Francis, that's in 2020, also goes back to, uh, you know, the problem of the Mother Earth. So now we're not speaking even about the Mother of God, uh, the Virgin, who had played a, an incredible role in uh, Catholicism, you know, uh, as the Queen of Heaven. Yeah, now the Mother is the earth, the earth who is bleeding and is sick wounded and who is the one to blame for this, of course, is all of us, small people. And as it is said in the documents of the Club of Rome, uh, the earth has got cancer and the cancer is the humans. So we have polluted it and despoiled it, endangering our very lives for this reason various international and local movements have sprung up in order to appeal to our conscience. You know, if you take this problem of pollution, I was a bit preoccupied with the issue of pesticides and especially the glyphosate uh, here in the UK and in Scotland. You will find that the, the biggest corporations such as Monsanto and Bayer and other couple of ones have produced and sold to the government and have poisoned the earth with them, not all because there were no solutions, but because that was part of their bigger plan, and because that's where the flow of money was. It's all and all about money. Yeah? So, of course, the people being needy and generally being blind to this issue, they tend to just go do their work. The knowledge is fragmented. Many of them do believe they're doing the right thing, for the society, for the community, but in reality, yeah, that's the result. The world is uh, sick, and especially if you speak about uh, military operations and weapons, there's a lot of pollution. And also nuclear pollution, if we speak about uh, depleted uranium, for example, that has been used in Ukraine, and we know who gave this to them. And uh, many other sources of pollution, it seems, uh, the American army is the greatest polluter in the world. So this is not simple people like us who do not want to see wars and destruction of human lives and property. But um, yeah, the churches do not really oppose the wars, never happened. And uh, therefore, we do have them. Sometimes they are even justified by the religious people. Uh, the Pope Francis in recently in 2023, here he is in a wheelchair, unfortunately, calls for obligatory global climate change policies. In his new document, Laudate Deum, yeah, obligatory because, uh, like uh, King Charles speaks also, we need a military style campaign. The crisis is too big, so we're not going to ask uh, people if they want to align to what needs to be done, but we're just going to implement the agreements, the COP agreements, the Paris Climate Accord and so on, because it needs to be done. Now, as I was speaking about these books in which uh, the Pope's agenda is very much uh, challenged, we have another book who's got great ratings, by the way. I don't know if many of them were Catholics or not, but I suppose that uh, Many Catholics do read this kind of books because they are challenging for their religion. And this is called, believe it or not, a dictator book. 
And it says, among other things, that he was so unsuited for ecclesiastical leadership. We know that he is a Jesuit, that the head of his own Jesuit order tried to prevent his appointment as a bishop in Argentina. Right, so this was even before he became a pope. There have been uh, articles, especially older ones, this has been published by the BBC in 2013, that Argentina dirty war accusations are haunting Pope Francis. Of course, the conclusion of uh, the article is in favor of uh, Pope Francis, but it gives a few hints to the fact that there have been people in Argentina who accuse Pope Francis to be a collaborationist with the military junta at that time during the Dirty War. So there have been many people in the opposition and activists, tens of thousands who were kidnapped and killed. There were quite a number of children who disappeared. But of course, we have at the end a couple of uh, testimonies from Alicia Oliveira, former Argentine judge, saying that he was uh, very critical of dictatorship and uh, he was concerned about uh, the priests who did social work in slums and he interceded for the kidnapped priests. And we have also a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And we know, by the way, that Obama, who immediately after his election was involved in uh, a couple of uh, military conflicts, was a Nobel Prize winner. But anyway, this one, who was a human rights activist and was arrested at the time of this dirty verse, speaks uh, in support of Pope Francis. He said that I know personally that there were many bishops as the military junta for the release of certain prisoners. And he says there is no link between the Pope and the dictatorship. So, yeah, we have mainly these two voices of the judge and the Nobel Prize uh, winner that uh, testifying uh, for the innocence of uh, Pope Francis, who was a bishop at the time of the uh, Dirty Wars. So there are a couple of uh, documentaries about this on YouTube. Just have a look and you'll hear other voices too. But anyway, let's say there's no involvement uh, in, of the Pope in uh, these things. He always has done the right thing. But he's got a number of quite uh, confusing affirmations about the Lord, particularly, and about faith. And we can hear him here speaking about the personal relationship with Jesus as being dangerous and harmful. Quante volte abbiamo sentito questo? E questo non va. C'è chi ritiene di poter avere un rapporto personale, diretto, immediato con Gesù Cristo, al di fuori della comunione e della meditazione della Chiesa. Sono tentazioni pericolose, sono tentazioni dannose. Oh, yeah, these temptations are dangerous, although in the Protestant faith, still a personal relationship with Jesus is the most important thing possible. And we know that if you read the letters of the Apostles, you know the, the Lord has sent His Holy Spirit, the Spirit of eternal love, exactly to ensure that the people have a communication with Him. Because the Holy Spirit proceeds from Him. And by the way, speaking about the filioque, the problem if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Lord, as the Catholics are saying, or just from the Father, as the Orthodox are saying, the first, the Catholic variant is confirmed in the New Revelation. So the Holy Spirit, the power of God, proceeds from His love and wisdom, therefore from the Father and the Son. So if you have the Holy Spirit and communicate with the Holy Spirit in the heart, you have a relationship with the Lord. But anyway, what else does... Pope Francis say, he says, uh, and this is a catholic.com, this is a catholic magazine, this says that uh, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, in the failure of the cross, which made many people, uh, especially Catholic, very upset. But this is justifying the Lord, emphasizing that from a human point of view, what is a human point of view? We speak from the perspective of the body when we speak about humans, when humans are souls that have taken the flesh, same as the Lord God has taken the flesh. There's no 
humanly speaking, a failure. The Lord, as we very well known, has predicted that he will give up his life for the people. He will allow himself to be killed in order to perform the, the greatest work of redemption and salvation. And this, this is fully and in greater detail explained in the great Gospel of John. And of course in the Gospels, in the known Gospels. Now there is also an Italian uh, journalist, Eugenio Scalfari, who published a, a very explosive article uh, attributing some shocking statements to the Pope, saying that he said that once incarnated Jesus ceases to be a god and becomes a man until his death on the cross, they are the proof that Jesus of Nazareth, once he became man, even if he were a man of exceptional virtue, was not a god at all. So, of course, the Vatican said that the Holy Father never said what Scalfari wrote. He's not a reliable source, especially because he's an atheist and he's uh, 95 years old, which makes him prone to memory problems. Very gentle way of saying. But, uh, yeah, by the way, he does affirm in some of his writings that the Lord Jesus is God himself you know, incarnate. On uh, the other side, that's a CNN article, very interesting, from 2015, that the Pope Francis is obsessed with the devil, and he says that the devil is not a myth, but a real person. You may be a bit curious to find out if this devil is called Lucifer, and I myself couldn't find any reference to the Pope calling the devil Lucifer, but he calls the devil Satan. Absolutely, and he is definitely a very evil entity. So yeah, because the Pope has been attacked not only by that journalist, but by a number of uh, Catholic sources, Pope Francis, as it says here, has put Satan in his right place. This is three years later, reported by Reuters. Yeah, so again, he speaks about uh, Satan, uh, says the devil is not a myth. Yeah, this is again about that article of uh, Dr. Eugenio Scalfari, the old journalist, uh, about um, Pope Francis uh, challenging the, the divinity of the Lord. So yeah, of course, the Vatican denies this. But let's see what the Pope has said a couple of years ago about Jesus. Gesù è uno spirito. Gesù non è uno spirito. Gesù è una persona, è un uomo. So Jesus is a person, a man. I don't know what uh, the Pope understands by spirit, but God is a spirit. He's in the Bible. So if Jesus is God, he must be a spirit. And in fact, each one of us, each one of us human beings are a spirit. And the spirits, as we know from the New Revelation, are inhabiting all matter. Everything is, at the end of the day, a spirit. We live in a spiritual creation, but just for the sake of our salvation and redemption, we have to go through this school of life and cover our souls with matter, which is the most reluctant form of uh, spiritual existence, the soul particles of the fallen ones. So, yeah, this pertains to the address in St. Patrick's Cathedral, New York, in 2015, September. So he speaks first to his uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, yeah, inviting them in joining in prayer to God, our almighty and merciful Father. And then uh, he speaks to his other brothers and sisters, priests and men and women of consecrated life, to build the edifice of uh, God's kingdom in this country. Let's, let's remember that God's kingdom is not built in the world. God's kingdom is the spiritual world, and in ourselves is in the spirit of God inside our soul's heart. But otherwise, the words are very, very lovely because uh, the Pope speaks about the spirit of uh, gratitude, the love of God, uh, the remembrance of uh, graces received from the Lord, the spirit of uh, hard work, uh, and even speaks about his first encounter with Christ. So this is a bit confusing also, because although the people are not meant to encounter Christ otherwise than through the church, he and probably other brothers and sisters 
have encountered Christ. So is this a symbolical encounter or is this a personal encounter, which means a personal relationship with the Lord? That's the big question. So, yeah, anyway, God sees to the fruits of our labors, which is very true. And here is where he follows with, and if at times our efforts and work seem to fail and produce no fruit, we need to remember that we are followers of Jesus and his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Uh, so it seems that in this common address to the Muslims and to his own priests, Pope Francis is uh, speaking about God and the Father and about uh, Jesus as being anyway distinct from God. You, you see the end. It says, um, I ask you like St. Peter to be at peace and to respond to them as Christ did. He thanked the Father, took up his cross and looked forward. That's everything he did. Did he eventually die on that cross? Did he eventually came back to life as a spiritual being and uh, spoke to his disciples? But anyway, for a, a temporary lesson of life, yeah, of course, St. Peter can surely be followed in his example of uh, thanking God and taking up the cross of uh, troubles and tribulations. Yeah, but it is interesting that if we look forward, we will find the Pope affirming the divinity of Jesus. This is quite recent. Also, probably because of the, all of the boiling in the Catholic Church, August 2023, so Pope Francis looked to Jesus always. So not to the Father this time, but to Jesus and he says here that emphasizing that Jesus is not just a historical figure, Christ is with us and Christ helps us to walk as he did with Peter and other disciples. So if he's not a, just a historical figure, a simple human being, is he a spirit or not? <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, look to Jesus always, look to Jesus who walks beside us, and this is extremely true, who welcomes our frailties, shares our efforts, and rests his firm and gentle arm on our weak shoulders. With Jesus we can go forward. Very good words. Spoke about the presence of Christ. There's very many wonderful people of God and mystics in the Catholic Church who spoke about this, the presence of Christ with us, meaning a personal relationship with God. So I wonder if you know, with him close at hand, he is not, in fact, speaking about uh, a personal relationship. Going forward, he affirms that Jesus is alive. Of course, not a human being of flesh and blood, but as a spirit, isn't it? Remember this, Jesus is alive. Jesus lives in the church, lives in the world. Jesus accompanies us. He is at our side. He offers us his word and his grace, which enlighten and refresh us on the journey. He, an expert and wise guide, is happy to accompany us on the most difficult paths and the most inaccessible slopes, he said. So now, again, he asks himself, as the disciples have been asked by the Lord, who the Lord is, and he says, if Jesus were simply a person from the past, just as the figures cited in the Gospel, John the Baptist, Moses, Elijah, and the great prophets were for the people, he would merely be a good memory of a bygone time. A good memory? So do, we do not believe that all these historical figures cited in the Gospels are alive in the Spirit right now? Are living souls? That's an interesting question to be asked. So, yeah. Jesus does not want to be known as merely a historical figure. He says he wants to be close to us. He's not a character from the past. He is the Messiah, the one awaited in the present. Not a deceased hero, but the son of the living God, made man and come to share the joys and the labors of our journey. Is he a great figure, a point of reference, an unattainable model? Or God the Son who walks by my side, who can lead me to the peak of holiness that I cannot reach by myself, he said. Whoa, whoa. So indeed, we have the Pope here affirming the divinity 
of Christ. He is God the Son. And He is walking by His side. You know, He's got a personal relationship with a human being. But I'm wondering if uh, the Pope Francis is just speaking about himself, you know, as the ruler of the church. For sure, he's not speaking only about himself because he encourages Catholics to ask themselves this. So this is a contradiction to the, the previous um, thing. But anyway, he concluded by asking the intercession of the Virgin Mary to help us to feel her son alive and present beside us. Yeah, this is uh, something very traditional to the Catholic Church, which is, of course, uh, contradicted by the New Revelation because the Lord God doesn't need any intercession, not even from his mother because he is the love, he is the mercy, he is the best friend, the best brother, the best father of each one of us. And he is, as it is presented in that plan of creation and salvation, revealed, he is closer to us than we are ourselves. But anyway, that's the vision. So he, in this moment, it sounds pretty traditional, pretty conservative, uh, conservative in the Catholic tradition. Uh, so, on the other hand, uh, coming back to uh, the devil, he speaks about Satan as a very smart person you should not argue with. I, and I believe, uh, unless you have the Lord at your side, yeah, it's not like you can argue with uh, Satan, but in order to argue with Satan, you have to conjure Satan, otherwise he has no power to influence any human being. So... Pope Francis has, says Satan is smart. He tells us that when we kick him out, he will go. But then after a while, when you are distracted, after a few years, he comes back with seven companions worse than him. Well, we have to go back to the scriptures and see that this is a, a parable of the Lord. Uh, and it's not Satan who is telling us this, but is the Lord. And he's not speaking about Satan, but he's speaking about a devil. And by the way, the devil is not Satan. The devil is a servant of Satan. Yeah, and as we know from the New Revelation, the devils are not uh, fallen angels, nor are they reptilians or other species and creatures of God, but are departed evil human beings who, by their own bad choices, have become adherents of Satan and who, of course, have a game to play with the still living people in the flesh and not only with them but particularly with them in order to compromise them and to bring them in the same army of servants of uh, satan because uh, one soul taken from the lord is a great win for satan absolutely he consider all of us as belonging to him and not to god and this is a very very interesting article from 2017, Rebuilding Catholic Culture, and of course this is the Catholic uh, resistance, and says that Pope Francis affirmed that Christ made himself the devil. Wow, this is something to follow up. So at the beginning of Francis' papacy, at Vatican Radio, here's the link, the author says, so that's June 2013, this is what Pope Francis affirmed, what is reconciliation? Taking one from this side, taking another one for that side and uniting them. No, that's part of it, but it's not it. True reconciliation means that the God in Christ, very well said, God in Christ, took on our sins and he became the sinner for us. When we go to confession, for example, it isn't that we say, our sin and God forgives us. No, not that. We look for Jesus Christ and say, this is your sin, your sin, I mean Jesus Christ's sin, and I will sin again. Oh, and I will sin again. And Jesus likes that because it was his mission to become the sinner for us, to liberate us, to liberate us in order to sin again. If I have any kind of logic, that's the conclusion, which is amazing. So that's another instance that has been found by the author, Pope's Morning Meditation in 2016. And he says, and this is the mystery of Christ, 
Paul, when speaking about this mystery, said that Jesus emptied himself, humiliated himself, and destroyed himself in order to save us, destroyed himself. And what's even stronger, he became sin. Using this symbol, he became a serpent. This is the prophetic message of today's reading. The Son of Man, who like a serpent became sin, is raised up to save us. The story for our redemption, this is the story of God's love. If we want to know God's love, let us look at the cross. A man tortured, a God emptied of his divinity, dirtied, stained by sin. But at the same time, he concluded a God who through his self-annihilation defeats forever the true name, the true name of evil that the Revelation calls the ancient serpent. So defeats the name of evil or defeats evil. I don't know, this is a bit too metaphoric for me. So further, I'm seen is the work of Satan. And Jesus defeats Satan by becoming seen. And from there, he lifts up all of us. The cross is not an ornament or a work of art. The cross is the mystery of God's annihilation for love. And the serpent that makes a prophecy in the desert is salvation. It is raised up and whoever looks at it... And the serpent is healed. And this is not done with a magic wand by a God who does these things. No, this is done through the suffering of the Son of Man, through the suffering of Jesus Christ. Wow. Further on. This is from Observatore Romano, April 2014. The serpent is the symbol of wickedness, is the symbol of the devil. It was the most cunning of the animals in earthly paradise. Because the serpent is the one that is able to seduce with lies, correct? He is the father of lies. This is the mystery. But then we have to look at the devil to save us. The serpent is the father of sin, the one that made humanity sin. In reality, Jesus says, when I am lifted up, everyone will come to me, obviously. This is the mystery of the cross. And again, he says, Jesus made himself the serpent. Jesus made himself sin, and he took upon himself all the field of humanity, all the field of sin, and he made himself sin. He made himself to rise up so that all the people might look at him, the people wanted by sin, us. Paul says it, he made himself sin, and he took the appearance of the father of sin, the cunning serpent, is there any surprise that now we are seeing people confusing Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, with Jesus Christ? Right. Again, he says. So the cross, for some people, is a badge of belonging. Yes, I carry the cross to show that I am Christian. And it's fine. I'm happy, he says, it's fine. But not just as a badge, as if it were a team, the badge of a team, but rather, says said Francis, as the memory of the man, man, he calls him God also, who made himself sin, who made himself the devil, the serpent, for us, he debased himself up to the point of totally annihilating himself. Wow. Yeah, this is a quotation from uh, St. Uh, Augustine, who speaks about uh, the Christ that, that heals us from the bites of sin. But anyway, that he was sinless and he suffered the sinner's punishment, Christ was crucified for us. I will return not to the fathers of the Catholic Church, but to what I believe with my life to be the word of the Lord in the New Revelation where indeed it's made very, very clear, and I have a, a brochure about this. Uh, here you, you find it in uh, presentations and excerpts from the website. Is this link. It's called Issue of the Sinful Flesh and Lord's Incarnation. So this uses the biblical uh, approach and the New Revelation uh, approach. And it is, deals with this uh, issue that was a stumbling block for some of my uh, Christian friends. So the idea is that by taking up the flesh and dying on the cross in other humiliation of this flesh, the Lord has ensured the redemption of all flesh. He has assured that all 
people will be brought back to him, which was his intention and his determination. Nobody will be lost, which of course uh, many of the Christians don't want to believe. They do want to believe that some of their brothers and sisters will rot or burn in hell forever. But no, that's what the Lord has done. He didn't make himself the devil, which is impossible. He wasn't one with the devil at that time, but he simply sanctified all the matter by projecting his Holy Spirit in all the particles of matter. And this is expressed in the New Revelation. So in every particle of matter, his life and his sacrifice are imprinted. And of course, in our spirit from God, you know, no matter how evil we are, in Pope Francis' spirit also. So this is what the Lord has done. He didn't become a sinner. He didn't encourage people to sin because he became a sinner. Wow, this is a very, very weird logic. So this was um, Pope Francis in 2018 again, after all his uh, affirmations about the devil. Yeah, so this is uh, also in that uh, article of um, Eugenio Scalfari, the, the old journalist, that uh, he would deny the existence of uh, hell. But yeah, we know that this has been dismissed by the Vatican, and in fact the Pope uh, affirms that he believes in um, hell. And that's where Satan is, not Lucifer, but Satan surely is in hell. And here we have the, this uh, other side of uh, the Pope's work. So we have the vaccination and global health side. We have the climate side. We have the, you know, the technological salvation of humanity and the financial one also to the IMF and the World Bank. But we also have this... Um, LGBT thing in which he's got a, a very permissive and loving uh, attitude. I mean, in this document, Fiducia Supplicants, he encourages his uh, pastors to bless the people who are in such uh, one sex uh, couples or marriages. And in another Catholic resistance website we find called firstthings.com, you find an article by Cardinal Gerhard uh, Miller in which he explains what is the deal with uh, a blessing in Catholicism that it, it involves also an approval of the situation in which the blessed ones are. That's why it's called the blessed. The blessing comes, in fact, from God through the mediation of the pastor or of the Pope, which cannot be uh, rightful and traditional in matters of uh, such unions. And here we have a very, very interesting short video from other Stanislaus of Guadalupe, who speaks exactly about this issue that uh, individually people can be blessed, but such unions cannot be blessed because what it's needed then from a Catholic point of view is repentance first. So you, can, you cannot have blessing before repenting uh, from a sin which is uh, not one of the most important uh, topics to be discussed by the Pope, however. And he, this is from 2013, from his beginnings, when he assures atheists, you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven, which was another bump inside the Catholic and not only Catholic, also evangelical environment. Because that's why people adhere to this uh, Christian churches because they want to go to heaven. And if he says you don't have to believe in God, just have to be a good person, it means, well, the churches are not necessary, including his own church, which is, by the way, also in contradiction with what he said previously, that you cannot have a personal relationship with Jesus, you know, God the Son, unless you go through the church, so you have to adhere to a faith in order to go to heaven. But there's many such contradictions that can be logically observed in his various uh, communications. So, we, of course, we don't know exactly what's his uh, representation of heaven, 
but uh, from the perspective of the new revelation by the grace of the lord there's a lot spoken there about heaven in particular about the three levels in heaven the heaven of wisdom the heaven of love and wisdom and the heaven of pure love where you are permanently with the lord as children of god and there's no way anybody can be in any of these heavens if not believing in god but however good people can be in what they can call paradise where you know the gentiles the good people have a, a life according to their conscience and their good deeds this is also spoken by paul in his letters that the gentiles will be judged according to the law written by god in their hearts so this is in the spirit of each human being the law of god even if you don't believe in a church even if you don't believe in god that love you know that law that you should do for the other what you want to be done to you and you don't have to do for the other what you do not want to have done unto you that we are all equal before a higher power these laws are in all of us and they are manifest in the voice of conscience so yeah they can be in uh, paradise these uh, good people and where they can have a pretty comfortable life but there's no real evolution for them so the lord ensures that this as much as possible doesn't stay like this forever they are subjected to various challenges because the purpose of the lord in creating human beings here and anywhere in the creation is for them to have a personal relationship of, of love filial relationship of love with him so everybody sooner or later must confess the lord it is in the scriptures all tongue must confess all knees must bow before the lord so how can they be in heaven because heaven is about god <laughs> That's why it's called heaven, is being with God, directly or indirectly, and at least with his angels. So speaking about uh, other humans, this is will be the object of, of a future video, because of course uh, in the Bible you don't find clear you know, disclosures about the life on other planets, you know, in the great cosmic man. But definitely it seems that the Vatican is determined to find out something about life on other planets so you can find videos about their project called lucifer it seems that they own some uh, infrastructure that can do this observatories telescopes even called lucifer although some people later on said that uh, it was a third party who called it uh, lucifer but of course they had nothing against it so they want to look in uh, creation this is uh, an interesting video about the final pop and project to Lucifer from Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. They both consider themselves to be prophets, not only missionaries and pastors, but uh, I have my reserves about their disclosures. But anyway, what they are bringing over about uh, this uh, project to Lucifer in their book called Exo Vaticana, this is quite an old book from 2013 and the vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior could be really interesting and it takes into consideration their uh, observatories and also some uh, disclosures offered by uh, their connections they are looking for the so-called uh, fallen star and maybe that's why cern is here also in order to open a portal for this fallen star or what they call the morning star which is not the morning star we said in the beginning it's just the son of the morning one of the angels of god in fact the first angel created and um, it seems that uh, the aliens are a point of uh, interest we also know as ronald reagan said once that uh, an alien threat will also unite humanity people would join as one uh, so there would be an end of all conflicts and war so you can have a new world order when humanity is confronted with such a threat also now these days we hear about uh, aliens everywhere on tv and in mass media and suddenly there's disclosures from nasa and from scientists and uh, so on and even the vatican uh, chief scientist said in 2008 that believe in god and aliens is okay so uh, for sure there are newer 
articles about their position towards uh, aliens. Yeah, the, the pop astronomer said says he would baptize an alien. Monsignor Balducci, who was a Catholic uh, theologian of the Vatican and a close friend of the, the Pope, and also an exorcist, you know, he says that uh, he's got an incredible archive of news clippings on UFOs and paranormal. Yeah, in my humble condition, I also want to speak a bit about this area from the perspective of the new revelation. But the idea is that he's very open-minded. He says that Jesus died for all beings in the cosmos. Yeah, why not? Yeah, this is quite true. But, yeah, the path is prepared in order to welcome the UFOs and the aliens and possibly to introduce a new world religion that would be acceptable for all the people. So now, if you look, just a Google search, isn't it? Aliens and Vatican, there's millions of results. And a couple of them are new, like Alien Connection of Vatican. Pentagon whistleblower says Church assisted US in retrieving a, a new FO. Right, let's see if there's something new. 2020, Vatican considers possibility of aliens. This is BS News pressure on Vatican to reveal archives after UFO cover-up. Yeah, this is new. So Pentagon and NASA and the Vatican are to be joining together in proving that there are UFOs and there are aliens visiting the Earth. Right, you have a lot of uh, links here, but this is not the subject. So the subject was uh, Lucifer and Satan. And in summary, we have seen that uh, it's an increased confusion between who Lucifer was. Lucifer disappeared as a name from most of the Bibles today. And uh, the Pope affirmed that uh, the Lord has become sin, has become the devil. There's very many references pointing at the light bearers, which used to be just uh, Lucifer or Satan. So things become more and more confused, and we just have to look at the, some of the prophecies, not only at the New Revelation, but uh, let's see the prophecy, the famous prophecy of uh, St. Malachi, who prophesied all the 112 popes ruling Vatican from his time in the 12th century till the end of times and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, about uh, Pope John Paul, he says, De labore solis, of the eclipse of the sun, and he was born during a solar e eclipse. And we will see immediately in Wikipedia what he is saying about Joseph Ratinger and Pope Benedict. He says it's the glory of the olive. And they said that uh, Benedict's choice of papal name is after St. Benedict, who was the founder of the Benedictine order, of which the Olivetans are one branch. This is not the only explanation. The other one is that he was a pope dedicated to peace and reconciliation. And what Malachi says that in the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, do we see any persecution of the conservative, traditional, uh, Catholics in the church, for sure, we see, because the church has come with many new teachings and biases during uh, this Pope's rule. He says, Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations, and when these things are finished, the city of seven hills, meaning Rome, will be destroyed, and a dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. The end. Time. But we know for sure that when the Lord will come, there will be just one shepherd and one church. So there will not be any division and any self-entitlement or worldly entitlement of people to guide the other ones as shepherds, as pastors, because the Lord, and we find this very clear in the New Revelation, His teaching is the real light. His teaching, and through His teaching, He Himself will rule the whole world. So, yeah, unfortunately, the institutionalized religions will find their end in these times. And we kind of uh, have a clue how this can happen. 
because they are subverted from the inside. And what is happening is that the Luciferian influences, the occult Gnostic teachings, which are very easy to be reconciled with the idea of aliens, you know, galactic federations, super beings, uh, and so on, it's very easy to establish. So therefore, yeah, after a lot of trials and tribulation, people who may be disappointed in their shepherds, who didn't really guide them and protect them in any way, shape or form, but they have been allies of the elites, of their persecutors, will try to look for a savior. And the savior will be provided. And the new humanitarian religion will be provided. And if anybody wants to look carefully at uh, Eliphas Levy's teachings or Rudolf Steiner, you will see a lot of humanitarian ideas over there. Just that God is not approachable. God is not Jesus Christ. God doesn't teach you to love your enemies also. You know, salvation is not based on his sacrifice. Yeah. So this will be the final theology of the people. What we can find in the prophecies of uh, the Virgin Mary given in Garabandal, uh, I have spoken about this in a separate video because they somehow converge with what we know both from the Revelation and the new Revelation. You know, speaking about the prophetic language of the Revelation and the, the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds and the sign of the Son of Man, this being the warning, so again, we can read about the three popes that the girl Conchita has been informed about uh, by the Virgin. And she says, so according to Conchita's testimonies, after this pope, so the pope that was in 1963, there are only three left. Then it will be the end of times. Soon after, the Virgin Mary specifies that even though she says that only three are left, there will be another that will govern the church for a very short time, which is why she does not include him on the list. So who were these popes? So these popes were Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict the 16th, so there was the Pope John Paul I, who was a, a very, it seems, a very wonderful character, but he kind of died suddenly of a heart attack after just 33 days of uh, reigning as a Pope, although he was just 65 years old. So that's a very interesting story, and you can find uh, quite a number of conspiracies suggested that he really didn't die of a uh, natural death. But anyway, let's go back to the prophecy. So we have Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict. But after Pope Francis' arrival, the start of the end of time will have begun. We kind of see a bit of a contradiction here. But yeah, we have three popes. But there's a fourth one, too, who's Pope Francis. So has the Blessed Mother made a mistake? Here we have, after everything that uh, the trouble that uh, Pope uh, Francis has done in the church, there are quite a lot of people in the Catholic resistance wondering if he is really the Pope and if his election was uh, legitimate. So there are arguments that uh, this may have been a setup, you know, in order to take Pope Benedict down. As we know, he is the first Pope in history who abdicated for reasons of uh, bad health. Uh, and um, now, of course, if we speak about all kinds of uh, conspiracies, not worthy to maybe have a look at uh, Leon Zagami's work, you can find it on the internet, Conf Confessions of an Illuminati, who was also very close to the Vatican. And here, there's an interesting uh, book about Pope Francis as the last pope, Money, Masons and Occultism in the Decline of the Catholic Church. He's got also uh, a number of uh, videos that you can find on YouTube and other platforms that are uncensored, such as BitChute and Rumble. 
yeah, this is the very same book that you can find on Google. And although you can uh, pay to download it, you can also read some of the things here, which are quite inflaming about uh, the Pope and his endorsement by various uh, Masonic Grand Masters. But we're not going to get into this. So I, I would really invite people to have a look at Daniel 11, in which uh, the prophet receives some very, very interesting message from the Lord, showing him what will happen before his second coming. And I have uh, spoken about this in one of my videos. It is right here, Daniel 11, prophecies about the end time, the last three popes, and the new world religion, of course, from the perspective of the new revelation and the revealed symbolic language so particularly when you sp we speak about kings we speak about religions we see the great fight between the king of the north and the king of the south so the king of the south appeared to me so this is not in the new revelation what really was the king of the south and the king of the north but uh, according with a bit of basic historical knowledge could be the catholic church so i have the arguments there and um the king of the north is the, the infiltrated Masonic evangelical faith. So this is the, the final fight for the new world religion. And where it's spoken about the princes, or prince, princes on the Lord's behalf, the Lord speaks in fact about high pastors, like is the case of the Vicar of Christ, meaning the Pope. So let's see prince. And we will see that in Daniel 11, we will have a description of the last princes before the Lord's second coming. So here we have the Lord, he that has the kingdom, of course, trying to enter in the world, you know, and convert the world and the isles, the, you know, the remote religions. But he says here, but the prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So the reproach of the Lord is, of course, the judgment of the pagan religion, of the lies and falsehood that are presented in, in these false teachings. This is the fight, the spiritual fight of the Lord and of all his true disciples. This is the sword of the Lord. So who is this prince who started cutting the Lord's reproach for the pagan teachings, I would say, if anybody looks into the history of the popes, it's kind of obvious. Pope John Paul II, who had a great ecumenical work, who we know that met with representatives of all the faiths, he even at a certain point kissed the Quran. Of course, uh, this pope has been the subject of several attempts to his life, and in fact, the greatest work that he has done in this ecumenical field happened after after these attempts when he was also old. And then the scripture given to Daniel says, Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of kingdom. So the taxes, of course, are not money, in fact, in a spiritual realm. These are the good deeds, these are the virtues according to the doctrine of faith. And if we look a bit at Pope Benedict's page, we see immediately that before becoming a Pope, he was a prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which formerly was the historical Roman Inquisition. Of course, it didn't work as the Inquisition anymore, you know, to save the people's souls by killing them and burning them at the stake, but however, it was meant to defend and reaffirm Catholic doctrine, which uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was very much into, and he had a, a real important theological work, you know. He didn't, in fact, want to become a pope, but he has uh, been elected as such. He was very much appreciated, was declared also as uh, one of the 100 most influential people, you know, in the world before his election. And what we can find, at least on this uh, page, is that he served many good cases, and he was very conservative 
in all the important matters that are causing uh, a lot of tumult in the church today, including the sexual abuse in the church, same-sex uh, issue, and also he put up a bit of resistance against other doctrines of faith, such as uh, Islam, but this has been uh, welcomed with uh, uh, a huge uh, scandal, so he had to give up on this. But anyway, the idea is, uh, it seems this pope was a bit too doctrinal for what was meant to happen after, so it says here in Daniel 11, but within few days, this razor of taxes in the glory of kingdom, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Yeah, because he chose to abdicate. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yeah, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Yeah, with the infiltrators of the church. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. The fattest is, you know, referring to wisdom, the, the theological uh, spheres of the faith. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yeah, and he shall forecast his devices against the stroke poles, against the real conservative faith, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with the great army. So the king of the south, as I said, I, I myself have identified with the Catholic um, religion, the Catholic faith. But of course, uh, this is debatable. And I admit that it's not my job to say more than the new revelation is saying. I hope the Lord will forgive me for this. But it really made sense to me. And I invite anybody who really is interested in this and who wants to take into account the explanation of the spiritual language of the new revelation to examine this uh, chapter these prophecies of daniel 11 and see what the lord is referring to because in the end despite the fight of these uh, kings and particularly this uh, king of the north the lord he shall enter into the glorious land and he shall stretch forth his hands and over all the people and he shall plant his tabernacles between the seas in the glorious holy mountain which is mountain to zion so this is the teaching of god and he shall come to his end so this is the final king the final king of the new world order or rather the new world religion and none shall help him because everybody will recognize the Lord. So, yeah, these are the last races, the last popes. So we have, I think, a mention to Pope John II, one to Pope Benedict, and then to Pope Francis. That, but Pope Francis, if you see here, is not defined as a prince, but as a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. So, they have been forced somehow to elect him. Uh, yeah, we know he's the first uh, Jesuit pope, and he doesn't have a theological body of works like uh, most of the popes preceding him. Though he, he wrote a couple of uh, works more recently, and we know that they have troubled many of the conservatives. But yeah, if we consider that uh, this last pope is not indicated as a prince, on behalf of the Lord, but as a vile man, we can understand here why the Virgin has not spoken about him as a Pope. And she has mentioned only previous Popes, three Popes, with the exception of John Paul I. This would make pretty good sense. Finally, returning to the subject, Lucifer and Satan, which are one and, it's, and the same, uh, so the, the Christian uh, uh, older Bibles are confirmed, and also the Christian tradition. Lucifer is the name of Satan before his fall. He is the archangel, he is the being of light, he is the light bearer, and uh, afterwards he is called Satan. So, yeah, if you just bother with uh, 
watching uh, my video about plan of creation and salvation revealed and the truth about Satan, uh, this uh, comprises excerpts from the New Revelation, uh, mostly from the Great Gospel of John through Jacob Lorber. And uh, by the way, somebody was asking if the churches are endorsing this. <laughs> As the temples at the time of Jesus Christ have not endorsed him, the churches today and for more than 170 years do not endorse the new revelation. Although it passes the biblical test, the same Jesus and the same gospel in an amazing way. But there are problems with the new revelation, you know, because the new revelation is a substitute for any human authority, for any superstition and ceremonial church. So if you have such a challenge, and if you still have a church, an institution, and if you still want to have a worldly or seemingly a spiritual authority over their fellow men, you surely will not accept this teaching. Sound and clear. But again, there's a lot about uh, Lucifer, aka Satan, or Satana in the New Revelation books, in very many of them, and you can find some of the excerpts, as I said in the beginning, here at uh, Fundamental Teachings in the blog, and here you go and look for the category called Satan. Here it is. Starts with the plan of creation and salvation revealed. It's given to the Lord to his disciples 2,000 years ago. So yeah, this was my presentation today. I know it's very, very long, but I think the world is really heading towards this new world religion and towards a, a really authoritarian and not humanitarian New World Order. I think that all these causes, including the alien brotherhood, can play a role in this. And by the way, you won't find evil aliens or other races or a federation or anything like this in the New Revelation because the chosen children of the Lord are the ones who are born in the flesh on this earth where the spirit of Satan is imprisoned. And even the angels, some of them are coming here in order to become children of God. And some of them had missions as prophets of God, as was the case with John the Baptist and Moses and other well-known Jewish prophets. So what is needed from us is to seek the Lord's face and to learn love from him, to be bearers of love, that out of wisdom, and this is clear in the new revelation, because in wisdom we are below the level of zero in comparison to the Lord, because once we have these teachings from the Lord and His direct word, and I will say that this is not the only communication from the Lord, He can be found in other places too, and that's why I put other resources in which I find the same Jesus, the same gospel, and the same infinite love. So, because the Lord has spoken to us, because he's the God of the living and not of the death, because everything is alive in his creation, and because this is the end time, I think it's very important for us, the seekers of truth, to do our own research and see what is happening with the Christian church. Because although people think, many people think, that Armageddon is something that is happening naturally in Israel, this is also spiritual prophetic language, and the Armageddon, the destruction of Christianity and of the children of God is happening right now, is unfolding before our very own eyes, and it's important not to be blind to this. So anyway, thank you so, so much for listening till the end. May the Lord our God bless you, and may you find the proper way to come closer to Him, to love Him more and more every day, and to spread His love and to share his light, but not like, like the bearers, to your fellow men, and even, even to your enemies. Because sooner or later, they will belong to the Lord too, even if he takes the use of them. That's why he died on the cross. So bless you again. All the best, and see you again by God's mercy and, and grace.